Hey everybody, welcome back. So today I'm going to be doing a video about the neutral cards in the Splinterlands set. I'll be talking about what teams they work well with, and I'm trying out a new microphone today, so please let me know if the sound is okay for you. It might be a little different than some of the other videos, but in my test the audio does seem to come through clear, and this is going to allow me to kind of not have to be so close to the computer, and I think the videos might look a little bit better. So, the neutral cards, as we all know, are very, very important because you can fit them into almost any place. But they're not really easy to sort here on the Splinterlands team. It's not quite as clean as when you're looking at a single team. So I'm going to do something a little bit different today, and I'm going to use the Pink Monster site. This is because the Pink Monster site, if you don't know about it, is basically a third-party site with some tools that kind of make it easier to look at things when it comes to rentals, when it comes to buying cards, and when it comes to doing things with your own collection. So I use them a lot. You should definitely check them out if you haven't. I probably should have featured them sooner in this series. But today we're going to be taking first a look at the neutral monsters because there's only neutral monsters at this point. And first we'll look at the Malay ones, then the magic, and then the ranged. And we'll talk about when and where you can use them. Also here you're going to see a little bit more info on their prices. So that's kind of an exciting thing to see. So we'll start off here first by going over some of the neutral tanks that you can actually use in this game. Now, a lot of people are going to not use the neutral tanks because the tanks on teams are usually a lot better unless it's the more very expensive ones. So we'll start out here. I'll go ahead and drop this down to the legendary melee monsters. That way we can have kind of a smaller thing to look at. And I will also take off. I will also go regular only. We don't need to see the gold prices. So as you can see, there are only two legendary neutral cards that would be considered tanks, and both of them are very, very expensive. Chain Golem fits in really well on any team that has repair in their skill set. So he can be a tank for fire. He can be a tank for life. He also works okay on the Earth team because he's a shielded tank, so he also works pretty good with any good healers behind him and anybody that can maybe give him more armor, which the Earth team can. He doesn't really fit in quite as well on the other teams as far as them being able to enhance him, but he can be played on any team absolutely, so if you're willing to spend the money on him, he is a pretty good card. Now the Hydra is one of the better cards in the game, and that's why it's currently sitting at a market value of around $300. You got a high bid of somebody out there ready to pay $200, and the lowest one for sale is at $300 per card. And that's probably one where you have to pay even more than that because it would be a lot more uh, cards in that one. Now, the reason why the Hydra gets so good is because it has a self heal. It's kind of low HP, but it has high attack and good speed. And then as you level the card up, it does get better. This is where I'll be going back to the Splinterlands set. That way I can kind of show you some of the cards that are um, as they level. So here you go. As you can see, when it gets to this high level, it has self-heal, thorns, retaliate, and trample. And now that low HP is gone because it, it gets a lot of HP per level. As you can see, it goes up 6 straight to 8 and then 9 and then 10. And the trample makes him just a ridiculous guy to deal with because he can, he can really just wreck another team. So if you have one of these, you're lucky. And if you want one of these, you're just going to have to pay quite a bit to get it. So that's one of the cards I wanted to focus on. He's also comboed very, very well with Llama. You'll see Llama last standing Hydras that'll just make you really sad when it beats you up in this game. So that's one of the things to know about. Now, when we go ahead and talk about one other possible tank that didn't show up on the Pink Monster site, and that's Lord A. Lord A is a very expensive card now, and he just like any of the other ones. But as you can see, when you get him to max level, he has 9 health, thorns, magic reflect, void, and shield. So he is a great front row tank, and he works well as a second position sniper on a like sniper map. Um, there's some uh, better cards to do that now with, but if you think you're going to have a lot of magic inbound snipers on like a sniper only mode, or everyone has sniper mode, then he's an interesting guy to throw there because he'll take half damage on that magic and he'll then sit back at them at the same amount of damage you're doing to him. You combine him with a silence usually because that'll make sure that mages can't kill him very fast. Or you can, uh, if you think you're going to be facing ranged, if you can put headwinds behind him, 
that makes him very, very hard to kill. You put either a silence or a headwinds behind this guy and a healer, and you're going to be looking good. Now, one of the things you'll notice, you're not really going to be looking to pick up these neutral tanks unless you want to spend a lot of money other than the new one, which is which is Almo. Almo, though, doesn't get good unless you get him to a higher level. And let me point this out to you as you look at his levels. At level one, he only has 12 health for seven mana. That's not really that great. And the four speed is not that fast. But then when you get him up, say, to at least here, now he has 15 health, which is very high. He has the um, ability to phase, which is dodging magic. And he starts returning um, return fire. And at 11, he starts bouncing back magic at the 16th health, or at level 4. So this guy's really fun to play with if you can get him here. And he's one of the cheaper cards that you could look to get if you're going to invest in one of those neutral tanks that you want to be able to play on any team in a high mana match because he is still able to be gotten in the rewards. So at the seasons, each time there's a season ends, some lucky players get a few of these, and some of those players will go ahead and sell them. So that's why this card is still sitting around for sale around the $40 range. And just to give you an idea, this is kind of the price range that Lord A was, and now Lord A is well over $150. And as you can see, these legendary cards, they trade in the $30 to $40 range, sometimes a little bit cheaper. And then once they are out of print, they pretty much jump up to around $150. And if they're a very strong card that's out of print, then you're talking about a $300 or $400 card. So this isn't a bad one to be buying right now. Now we're going to go head over to Peak Monsters. We're going to take the legendary off. And now we're going to talk about some of the other cards. So first we'll go into the rares. So the rare Malay monsters, as you can see, are not really anything that I would consider tank worthy other than the cockatrice. This one only at higher levels when it has dodge and very hard speed, you'll see people throw it in the front position, especially if they can give it a little bit more health and a little bit more speed. This is kind of notorious on the Earth team. They use this tank in front of uh, a couple healers and with snipers behind and it, it'll dodge and dodge and dodge and it's really frustrating but he is a hard card to get at max level the reason why he's a hard card to get at max level let's go ahead and go down to the rares is because there's only 165 for sale and to get him up into the levels you need you need 21 only to give him here and they'll have dodge but you need 115 to get him to max level that means with the entire uh, 165 that are for sale that can only net you one max card this is the kind of card shock we're having right now with these older cards it'll be and i don't know if you'll want to spend the kind of money you'll need to get this to high level now hobgoblin's a nice card to have on your team because he has a double attack so in any mode where monsters can attack from anywhere he's an interesting card to put on the board if everyone has opportunity if you have monsters mayhem if you have any uh, Malay monsters only, he's even not too bad to have on your team. And he's a little bit cheaper. Now, his downside is that he has only five mana, but he does, uh, he costs five and his attack is pretty low, but he attacks twice each turn. Thorns is a big problem for him, though, and he doesn't play in the next set. So, you know, all of these cards, except for the chicken, if the, even the chicken will be playable in the next set. So, None of these are really that important for you to try to get at this point if you're a new player. An older player, who's, you should probably already have these. So let's go ahead and talk about the commons. Okay, so there's some great cards in neutral set commons. And we're going to focus first on the ones in the Untamed series because they can go ahead and be used once Chaos Legion comes out in the new modern format. So a newer player, you should kind of focus on the good Untamed ones. Horny Toad is actually a better card than people think he is. At three, he can level up and get a poison and a second account, um, attack, and he only costs three. So in any mode where you're short on mana, if that's a troublesome thing for you, this card can help because he only costs three. You can throw him in the second position, he can still attack, and he has a poison. Poison is more powerful than people think, especially if you're in a lower mana match. Now, these two right here are both opportunity monsters, so that makes them pretty special, and that's why they cost a little bit more, but they're still not too bad to just go ahead and get on your team. If you're just trying to get these guys to be high enough to compete in the Silver Leagues, it's not going to cost you that much, and then you can combine them 
with some of the other opportunity monsters in the game, no, the most notable on the fire team, to go ahead and run opportunity teams. Opportunity teams can be good. The one bad thing about the battering ram and the parasitic growth is that they're slow. So they work better in reverse speed games and you or you need to have a team that speeds them up. Now, as they level, they get faster, but when they're sitting there at one speed, it, sometimes they're just going to be trying to hit a monster and miss quite a bit. Let's see. The, the Elven Defender is not really important, except for if you're someone who likes to play in untamed only tournaments. He's actually, if you get a 99 Mana Max there, there's not that many cards that cost a lot. So sometimes doing two front row tanks, even though the second one can't um, attack, is the best way to play it. Just because it's going to take them forever to kill those two front tanks, and then you can put your biggest attackers behind them. Uh, but that's only really, you know, happens in the untamed only. That's why he's not very expensive. He doesn't really fit the bill too well, because mostly, if we go to the comments here and we look at him on his levels, he gets a shield, but that's all he gets. So he's a he's a victim to magic really picking on him. And at 8 cost, only 10 health, 3 attack, a shield, and knockout. It, it's just a weird card. It's not a terrible card. You can play it and you can win with it, but it's not one that kind of demands market share at this point. Now, the, the one here who you're going to see is probably one of the more expensive common cards, certainly newer common cards that are still, still in print, I believe, is the Sandworm. That's because the Sandworm is amazing. So we'll go back over here to go ahead and look at the Sandworm. Um, he still has 957 for sale. So even though, the, but remember, 400 to max him out. That's only two maxed out cards for sale. This isn't something I've talked about enough, but I figured I should kind of point out, if you want to get high level cards, you need to do it now. Now, you can get one to level six for only 100 cards, and so that's a little bit better, but still at $2 a card, that's a $200 card, but he is just that good at upper levels. I mean, you're talking seven attack, seven health, four speed is pretty good. He has seven attack with piercing, so even if somebody has two armor, he's going to melt right through that and still kill the monster. And he has a snare, which can be important if you have some slower sneak monsters on your team or slower opportunity monsters as he might hit a big flyer and take that speed away from them. Also, he's kind of a funny play in an earthquake game because he has enough health and if you give him some armor, he's not going to die really quick and he'll take flying away from the other team when he's hitting them. So if he doesn't finish them off with that seven attack, maybe the earthquake will then finish them off. So it's an interesting play. Now, the elven cutthroat is a pretty important card to have in your team if you want to play sneak. Um, because it's one of the few neutral cards with Sneak, but it's really expensive at this point. You can't play it in the new set, so I'd only really go for that if you're trying to pay, play in the major sets. The the Enchanted Defender is kind of pointless until you get him his Thorns. Then he can be used as an anti-Sneak mode. So you can play him here at, uh, at level 5, a common, so you'd still be able to play him in Silver. You, you put him in the last position in a Sneak, in, in a everyone Sneak, game or in a melee only game and he has six armor and thorns so he's going to do thorns back to people maybe three to four to five times depending on how much they attack him that can make the difference and win you a game sometimes he's also a funny position a person to put in the first position in a melee only mode just because he has that thorns and really high armor so there's a chance in that first tank battle he might make up somebody kill themselves. He's also a great card to put in opportunity uh, games where everyone has opportunity if he has thorns because now this one health monster is making all those melee opportunity monsters come and attack him and he is um, just laughing as he does thorns to them and they can't get through his armor, especially the weaker ones. So it's an interesting card. Obviously, with one health, one mage on the other side ruins that. So he's also a little bit more viable if he has magic armor. Okay, is there anybody else? To, oh, the, the Creeping Ooze is a nice card to have. One mana slows the other speed down. You can pick one of these up at level one, and it's playable. He's also playable as a target for a sniper if he doesn't have any melee attack. So you should have one of these on your team if you're playing in modern format. I mean, in, in the uh, all-around format. If you're not planning to play in that format ever, it still might be worth it for you to try to get one of these. Uh, just to have it because that slow can make a big difference. Speed is very key. 
Goblin Mech is a fun card, but it can't be played in the new set. But it is something to have for those big 99 mono matches. Sometimes he, he pays, he has a stun. Stuns can be really good. He has a good attack with piercing. So he's, he's not a bad card. Now, the Rusty Android at this point, because he's been out of print and he's over a dollar, you're probably going to skip him. He's not a terrible tank in the beginning to counter all those times you get killed by water teams because he will bounce that water back at them. But he's really slow. So you can't really play him unless you've leveled him up to a decent level. And as you can see, you know, it's going to cost you maybe like $20 to get a level five. And then he's got a little better speed and a little better attack, but he never picks up any kind of buff. So even though he can bounce magic back, he can still die really quick from magic. So it's an, it's a, it's kind of a risky, risky play. All right, so we're going to move on from talking about the Malay monsters, and we'll go ahead and talk about the... Me, these are ranged, right? Oops, how come I can't see? Oh, because there's no comment. Okay, we'll just go ahead and put... No, these are the mages, so we'll just put all the mages on the board because there's not that many to look at. The, the Tortoise Chief is one of the only neutral back row tank heals I, I think he is the only one. And he adds a back row tank heal to some of the teams that don't have a back row tank heal. Like the death team does not have a normal card that's a back row tank heal. So they have the undead unicorn, but he is extremely expensive and rare, comes from the dice set. And he's a healer, but he has to be a melee monster healer. This is your only card that can become a, 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 a ranged monster up to epic here and and a mage but the problem is he doesn't get it until level four so realistically you don't need this card unless you're going to get him to level four and you're playing in a place where your epics would be level four so for a new player you can kind of ignore this card for anybody that wants to compete in the upper leagues you will need a tortoise chief uh, especially in the new set because there are some healers that are very very powerful if you want to compete in the new format that are going to disappear when we go into that Chaos Legion. Now, I don't know what Chaos Legion is going to have, so there might be other healers, but this card is a nice one to have. He fits he fits the bill for being a good back row healer. The Prismatic Energy is an amazing card. This is why it's gone up in value so much. It can, it's a big eight cost, very fast, uh, high damage mage. And we'll go look at some of their levels. The Enchanted Pixie is an interesting card. It's pretty expensive because it has Inspire for three. Inspire for three that can be put on any team. So you can take any kind of team that needs that, that runs a lot of melee monsters, throw the Enchanted Pixie on there, and they're going to hit harder. So it's a, that is why this card has so much value. The um, Magic Sphinx is not as big and as important as she used to be. It's probably why her value is like the bids on it are not super high. And the price per card is still sitting on $26 for an epic card that is beta and a lot older. It's because while this card used to be like kind of the king of five, five, uh, five costs for three magic attack, and that used to be really good, there's a lot more monsters on the magic team now that actually can do three to four magic attack. So it, it doesn't have any great abilities, so it's not quite as good. The Elven Mystic is a really nice card because it's a four cost card with a decent amount of life, magic attack, and a silence. So anytime you can have a silence that you can add to any other team, that's really good. Again, though, you only need to get him if you're going to get his silence. So if we go ahead and look at him, I think he's a little rare. Yeah, he gets his silence at level four. So this would be if somebody who's going to be competing in the Silver League, maybe making it into the Gold League. He's not really as good until he gets his second attack and he gets a lot better when he also has affliction so as, as you can see a level eight affliction and silence means that he might stop the other team from being able to get healed and at the same time weaken those magic users so he's a very very important card he can help you pull off a double silence very easily cyclops only 62 for sale you're not going to get him to the level that you need him. So if you kind of look at this, oh wait, we're not supposed to be doing range yet. Is there any mages to go over? Oh, okay. So the spirit miner, the spirit miner is really good. He's one of the legendary cards. So we'll go to legendary, and we'll talk about him and his stats. So at max level, he is a speed buff who makes people have a better chance of missing because your monsters are faster, and because 
he has got a uh, blind. He also has dodge on a magic monster, which is quite interesting to see a what ends up being a four speed monster, sometimes played in a lineup with multiple people adding speed or slowing the other side down to give you a big speed advantage. And then if he has dodge on top of that, so it can be quite hard to kill. Now, other mages take him out pretty quick because he doesn't have a lot of life, but if the other team isn't running mages or they don't have a mage that's attacking him, he's a very, very good card to hide in the back of your team to speed them up. A lot of time matches can be decided by who attacks first, and anybody who's been playing this game for a while should know that. All right, let's get over here to the ranged monsters. We'll just go ahead and leave them all in place, and we'll go ahead and talk through these, and then I'll kind of do a quick recap of uh, where I think, which ones I think help teams. The Highland Archer at this point, while he's a very good card if you get him to high level, he's going to be pretty expensive because he's out of print. But, you know, his three cost to eventually do three damage is really good. So it's a pretty cool card. The Goblin Chariot is a really nice card to have because at low level it has two ranged attack. So if you're a bronze player, this is a nice one to have to add to your team because doing two attack matters a lot because it gets at least one damage to a shield and it can give you a fighting chance. The Mantoid is one of another good card because it's a two attack at level one and because it's a sniper. So this can be used as a added card into making you the kind of sniper teams that are out there. The Tower Griffin is a great card because it is a neutral protect that can give armor to other teams. I've talked about this card in the past in some of my videos and how it can give armor to teams that don't have armor or it can give armor to a team that do just to make them have that much more. The Grenader is a great card. It's one I'm going to fork over some money for and max out here pretty soon. So none of you front run me. I need to get some cheap ones. <laughs> I only have him at level four and I really need to get him to the point where he has that splash damage because I like to try to use this card, but I don't have him leveled up enough. And so it hurts my team a little bit. Uh, he has uh, the Oppress skill, which I haven't talked about a lot, but it really helps you get rid of some of those interesting cards that you see in the front row in certain modes that... Uh, have no attack by doing double damage and so when he can has his three attack and he's hitting for six on some of those monsters or at least he's still hitting for three if they're shielded it can be a big help for your team the war chain is a very cool card because it's a melee card with a ranged attack on it so anytime you're in a melee monsters all melee monsters mode war chain can be stuck in the back of the row to do ranged damage and then if they have sneak monsters possibly retaliate at them so this card is definitely one that you want, um, especially because in the, in the new set, I think he will be a lot more powerful. He also can be used in, in any time there's uh, ranged monsters can attack from anywhere as your front row tank or a uh, second row tank. So that's that, like, well, your front row tank because then he's got both attacks. And he also is pretty good in like an opportunity game because then you can put him in the back and he uses both of his attacks. Uh, Cornelius is a really good card because it's a high HP monster with a self fill. This is a card that you will need to compete in the upper levels. He also gets return fire, which is really cool. You can put him in the sniper position. People will hit him, but he'll bounce that back. He also gets uh, return magic. So this is really like the number one card to put in your sniper position to tr kind of bounce a lot of magic, magic back at snipers. Or you can put it in an off position if you wanted to. And then the half the the alchemist here is definitely an interesting card. Really expensive. Eventually, he gets the ability to make it so that people have less attack. He halves their attack if he can hit them. I don't really love this card though because it's slow. So if if you even at max level, he still only has two speed. So he misses a lot, and the only point to using the Halfling Alchemist <laughs> is to half the other monsters attack. So when you miss, it's just, it's devastating. Now, one of the things that's kind of interesting that you should take note of are Redemption Monsters. If you get yourself a set of Redemption Monsters, you can play them in modes like Earthquake or Poison to kind of stack on top of the fact that those monsters are already taking two damage per turn if they're not flying, or everybody on the team is taking two from the poison, then your Halfling Alchemist gets popped kind of early, but it's okay because he does one damage to everybody on the other team who's all being killed by poison. And then you can stack him with some other cards that have that, and so that's an interesting reason to go ahead and hit him. All right, now if I go back over here, who haven't we talked about in this set? 
think that's it. Let me go ahead and click on the mages one time. I didn't talk about the Dwarven Wizard. He's an interesting card because he's a stunning sniper, but that's the only way he kind of fits in because he's a slow sniper. So it, he can definitely be a cool card to have if you get him to the level where you want his stun. Otherwise, he's not really worth investing. <sighs> Sorry, guys. I gotta start getting a little more sleep in. <laughs> okay, this is definitely one card I didn't talk about. I think it's because uh, they don't seem to have a mode on Peak Monsters to go ahead and show you um, the guys with no attack. So that's why we didn't, we didn't see the Lord A. So this is Onyx Sentinel. The Onyx Sentinel is a very interesting card. But he's very boring at low level. So again, this is a card for people who are going to be more in the medium leagues of gold, silvers, and maybe competing up into diamond. Because if you get him here, he has a shield, um, a void, and then return return archers and ran, does damage back to melee. So the only person he doesn't hurt back is mages, but mages definitely only do half damage to him. He's an interesting card you could in that second position in a lower mana match instead of Cornelius could be like, hey, snipers, go ahead and try to kill my Onyx Sentinel. If you're a mage, you're going to do half damage. And if you're an archer, I'm going to bounce the damage back at you. And then if you can throw a, a Trias next to him, then you can go ahead and be healing him. He, the one thing about him, he's not designed to not be hit, but maybe it's because he has a shield, he has a void, he has thorns and a return. He's not really doing his job if he's not taking hits. If you can play him on a team in the back row where you think somebody might be coming in either in the sneak position or the sniper position and you guess right, you throw two triages next to him and they're going to wreck themselves on this card. It's an interesting play. It's one of those ones where if you're really studying the way people play, you can beat them. I think I may have forgot about the uh, Raging Impaler. This is an older card. Uh, he is a pretty interesting one, but as you can see, only 13 for sale. He's not part of the new set. He eventually levels up to uh, have Enrage. And, and then eventually when he gets his shield, you can see that he could be a pretty good front row take with shield, piercing attack of four. And then he's going to uh, get Enrage once he hits, which is going to make him hit harder and be even faster. So this is definitely an interesting card. Now let's see, is there anybody else that I have to talk about that we didn't touch on because I just forgot? Nope, I think we pretty much touched based on just about every single major card, at least in some way or another. Oh, the cube. I forgot about the cube. Now, the cube, as, as people are going to be very happy to see, is not in the untamed border. So you're no longer going to have to deal with that thing where you rip apart another team, and then there's just a cube left that you can't kill. Um, the, the, but the cube is very important. If you're, if you're someone who's going to play in the, in the format where everyone can play, you really need a maxed out cube. That's problematic, as you can see, because if we go back to here and look at the red number on the cube, there's only 447 available, and it takes 507 to level him up. So you could buy every single cube for sale, and you would not be able to get a maximum cube. And then the very last one at the bottom, you'd be paying 120 per cube for. So as you can see, Something that they're going to hopefully fix for us as this game grows is that the next sets will have more cards, be more in abundance, and have higher print rates on the rewards cards. Because a lot of cards have got to the point where even if you wanted to get a max one, you could not. Or you would have to be paying really, really crazy prices at the top levels. Um, let's talk about the cards that really fit in and help teams. So obviously, I have, let's see, who didn't I touch on? Okay, well, obviously, you need the Sandworm to do the sneak teams. So any, any team that has one or two sneak monsters, like the life team, you want a Sandworm if you're a life player. Um, Cyclops, I didn't talk about that much because I just don't think you're going to really be able to get him here to level 6 very often. But if you have at least a level 6 one, he is an excellent card to have in a reverse speed game because he has then he's going to attack first with a stun. And he's a shielded card in the back row, so he doesn't go down very easily if somebody is using some sneak monsters, or if he ends up in the first position, at least he takes a little bit of time to go down. I just want to see if there's anybody special I want to talk about for any particular team. I don't think so. I mean, the healer goes with pretty much every team. 
I think the silence one goes with every single team and would fit more in if your tank doesn't have a uh, void. So if your tank that you like to use doesn't have void, that's really important. We didn't really talk about the Gremlin Blaster. He's kind of a funny little card. I don't really see anybody needing him. At a, for three cost, one damage is not that good. He's also kind of slow. He was like kind of broken and had a way to like kind of cheat the game, and so he got nerfed in the beginning. But I never really saw how he, he was able to break the game. Now, if you have one sitting here with, with one uh, with stun and blast, and you can use some inspires to make him attack harder, and then you play him in like... Um, there's a few modes where you can play him. Where melee monsters can attack from the back row. If you have three monolith, you can throw him out there because a three cost stun is awesome. And he does blast damage, so at least even though he hits only for one or two, if maybe if you're boosting him, he'll hit, you know, for an additional one when he blasts. And depending on where he goes and attacks, he might blast on two people. Now it seems you, you can only stun the primary target, so this isn't super broken. But at the same time, the um he just doesn't hit that hard. You know, right here, even at max level, he's at two. So even if you buffed him twice, he'd be at four. I guess four for three with a stun and blast isn't terrible, but he's 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 really squishy. So he'll kill himself quick on thorns, or a mage will just mage or archer will just kill him really quick. So he's kind of an interesting card. We can go ahead and look see if you level up a toad to here, just level six, he's got two attack and poison. And then if you max him out all the way, now he's got four speed, three attack, and poison. I actually like that card. I, I don't play him as much because I forget, but he's not a bad card at all. Oh, the Peaceful Giant is an interesting card. He is needed for the uh, modes where nobody has any abilities because you can sit him in the front row to be a high HP tank for low mana cost. But he's been replaced with some other cards that are a little bit cheaper than him. Um, so our, our He's been replaced, in my mind, by a lot of different cards that can do that. That's why he's not super, super expensive. So you could pick one up, but again, if you're a newer player, he won't be usable in the new set. So maybe you just want to kind of hold off and kind of focus on the, the ones with the untamed borders here. All right, guys, I just want to say thanks to everybody that's been checking out my channel. My subscriber account has been growing. And with, now that I've finished off this set and I've talked about some of the neutral cards, I'm going to go ahead and put together a little playlist of all these guides so that you can uh, kind of tell people to come check them out and see if they're interested. Also, let me know how the mic did and give me any suggestions on what you want to see me cover next in this one. Thanks. Bye.